I'm Roger. I'm an alcoholic. Roger. I've been uh, continuously sober since October 11th, 1978. And uh, the way I've maintained that is uh, by doing the things we're going to study in this text. So we're at the forward to the first edition, Roman numeral uh, 13, XIII. This is the forward as it appeared in the first printing of the first edition in 1939. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we've recovered is the main purpose of this book. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person, and besides, we are sure that our way of living has its advantages for all. Now, I don't know about you guys. Um, I read this book three, four, maybe five times the last couple of years I was drinking. It didn't mean anything. It had no significance at all. And then I started reading it when I was sober, and it had no significance. It was all, uh, it was all foreign material to me. So I would never read something as silly as a forward or a preface. But in this first paragraph, there's some big promises. Understand, the we in this book is all the alcoholics that recovered using this method at the time. So in the book, when they say we, they're talking about the people that have recovered using this method. They agree. This is their consensus. And they're not talking about the we in the fellowship that we have now. But at this time, the fellowship was doing exactly what the book was doing. That's what it is. The book was the the uh, codification of what they had done collectively. So they're saying there are more than 100 men and women, which is a stretch. There were about 80. But, you know, we're alcoholics. We want it to look good. <clears throat> but they refer to themselves always as recovered, not recovering, I'm in recovery. I'm treating my alcoholism. But I'm not going to be recovering from it the rest of my life. They're saying you they've recovered from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Not that they've been cured from alcoholism or of it. But you can recover from the mental and the physical estate that you arrive in. That's important. Because if you're new and I'm 28 years sober and I'm telling you I'm recovering, it's like, well, when the hell does this end? How long am I going to be recovering, you know? Well, you're going to recover. This book says or they refer to themselves as ex-problem drinkers and recovered. So think about it. There's a big promise there. I don't know for you, but for me, for several years in my early sobriety, I had the voices. And I had, on a good day, I had about six of them. And they were all contrary. And it's, it's it, the Buddhists call it the monkey mind. You know, it's just your mind is just running all the time and it's running on multiple tracks and you got no way of controlling what's going on with it. No peace. Always chewing on you. And now you're sober and you can hear it better and you're much more aware of it. And it's it's a problem. They're saying this is going to go away. Then they're showing they're saying to show me other alcoholics precisely how they recovered is the main purpose of the book. So what we have is a textbook. It's an instruction manual. It's not a storybook. They wrote the book because they wanted to put the experience down. There's a bunch of stories in the back, 30-some stories in the back, because this book was originally intended to be all I needed to recover from my alcoholism alone because there were no meetings and there were no treatment centers all over the country, and guys would write in and they'd order a book and they'd mail it out to them. And they were expected to be able to get sober on what was in the book by doing what was in the book. It's it's interesting... uh, one of the things I do, uh, I do uh, recording, audio recording, and I was up doing a, uh, a group anniversary in North Dakota, it's where, and, and it was the history of how AA got to North Dakota, and it was a farmer, and he got the book, and there were three of them, and they drove about 75, 80 miles once a week to get together, and that's how it started, just trying to figure out the book. And they sit down with each other, and that's how AA came to North Dakota. And in Minneapolis, it was Pat Cronin, the guy that uh, was the uh, founder of uh, 2218 and, and brought AA to Minneapolis. Pat Cronin got hooked up with a guy in Winnipeg named Mac Cheater. 
And Mac Cheater had a group up there called the Golden Slippers because none of them could stay sober. And they brought the book up to them, and they taught them how to do it. And that's how AA got started in that part of Canada. And it, it just goes on and on. So everything I need to recover is in the book. So it's imperative for me to figure out how to make the book make sense to me. Because I read this always in the context of disidentifying. I was always looking for the things that weren't about me. When we get into Bill's story, it's full of it. You know, it's just like that doesn't apply, that doesn't apply, that doesn't apply. When you're looking with those eyes, you'll be right. Nothing will apply, and you'll think this is a bunch of crap. Doesn't make any sense. Why do it? Absolutely. That's the conclusion of that mind, with that perspective. But if I'm sitting here and I'm going, man, something's got to change. This is a way out. And they always refer to it as, we have found a way. Not the way, a way. We got something that works. We're not saying other people don't have stuff that works. In fact, when we get later into the chapters and we talk about sponsorship, they say, hey, if you think you can do something better, find something better, go do it. You think you can smoke pot and do the steps? Do that. You want to go back to your church? Do that. You want to just get what you got and go back and pay your bills? Well, you're going to do that. You know, go have your experience. And when you're done having that experience, if this book is right, you'll fail. Because it'll be based on self-reliance. You'll fail. And then you've got a chance to come back and do it again. So, we've got a textbook. And they're saying that they hope when I read this, I'll be so convinced I won't have to keep drinking. No further authentication will be necessary. That's a big promise. Because when we get here, I don't know about you guys, but I was convinced I was dying of a drinking problem. If we were dying of a drinking problem, how come after a few weeks of not drinking, or a few months, or a year, how come it's so unsatisfactory? You're not dying of a drinking problem now. Everyone in here has been sober long enough they're detoxed from alcohol. We're all as physically sober as we're going to get. The problem is we can't stay sober. And the reason I can't stay sober is because sober is sucks. That's why it's unacceptable. I don't have a way to be in the world and not have to medicate myself. So I came here, certainly I had a drinking problem. My drinking was problematic. It was killing me. No problem with that. But now that I'm not drinking, what's the problem? And we're going to find really early on in the text, this centers all around our thinking. They're assuming we've stopped drinking at one point. And then we're off to the races. So what's this about? Why are you doing all this inventory? That's all you're thinking. It's all your perceptions. And if I don't get to find a way to deal with my thinking, I'm screwed. Absolutely screwed. So, there you go. Um, let's look at the doctor's opinion. <clears throat> Roman numeral 23. That would be XXIII. Oh, we got different. We got different. Uh, we got different uh, editions. That's okay. Look for the doctor's opinion. How about that? <laughs> I don't know what page you got. Are you all in the fourth edition? Uh, okay. I'm in another one. I'll tell you in the break. Um, okay, the doctor's opinion. We, there it is again. We, the body of the people recovered using this text. I'm going to stress that because when we read we, we think us. Now, this is a different we. And you guys, I'm sure, is there anyone in here who has never been to a meeting? You've never been to an AA meeting? Okay, that's great. You, you get in my pocket. <laughs> um, <laughs> so everyone's been to meetings, here. except for this guy. And you've been to meetings here. Yeah, no okay. Else, what I'm trying to say where I'm going with this is everybody in the fellowship, in the meetings, is not doing the program of recovery. Okay? Just because you're going to AA meetings, it doesn't mean you're in AA. It means you're going to AA meetings. You're in the fellowship. You're in the gathering of like fellows in a room once, twice, three times, maybe 20 times a week. But that doesn't mean you're in a recovery program. That means you're in a room with people with similar disorders, 
Likes, dislikes, maybe. But that just means you're in the fellowship. The program recovery is the steps. And then this, in this context, they refer to it as the fellowship of the Spirit. So you can go to meetings where they just don't drink and go to meetings. And there seem to be people that can handle that. But the kind of drunk I was, and really the kind of person I am, is if you're going to tell me to hang up all this this fun stuff I've been doing that's almost killed me and ruined my life, you're going to have to give me a substitute that's far in excess of that. You know, I thought I was having a ball. I thought I had a great life, you know. And I was, uh, I was uh, given a terminal diagnosis at 28 years old. So I was having a ball. I had kidney and liver damage. I was peeing blood. I was leaking blood out of every hole in my body. I uh, had a distended liver. I had restraining orders both ways on the first wife. I had uh, warrants in a half dozen states. I had several thousand dollars worth of bad checks around town because my philosophy with money was if you have checks, you have money. And uh, they didn't all agree. <laughs> then I had to open a few accounts, you know, to pay each account off. And it was a mess. And then I had uh, some uh, guys in a motorcycle gang. I'd done a little entrepreneurial work <laughs> and a uh, little import-export. And uh, they were looking at me. Uh, because I owed them several thousand dollars, and they were not interested in my evolution at all. They wanted to kill me. I had a life that had devolved to the point where if I went grocery shopping, I had to go at 2 in the morning so I could scan the parking lot and make sure I wasn't being followed. Okay, That was my life. That was my life as run by me, created by me, because I ran the whole show. I did everything I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, with who I wanted to do it, and the quantities I wanted to do it. I was totally free to do as I pleased. And by me managing my life, um, I was almost dead by the time I was 28. So back to the we of Alcoholics Anonymous. Believe that the reader will be interested in the medical estimate of the plan of recovery described in this book. Convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have had experience with the sufferings of our members and have witnessed our return to health. A well-known doctor, this is Silkworth, chief physician at a nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcohol and drug addiction, gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. There was only a couple places in the United States you could go for treatment for alcoholism because in the 30s, it was still considered to be a moral question. It was just a lack of self-discipline, low moral stature, and there was a terrible stigma attached to it. Now, note also, he's saying this was a center for alcoholic and drug addiction treatment. Those are two different things. If we got 50 guys in the room and we shoot heroin for a month, we're going to have 50 addicts. If this was a normal sampling of the population and we did the same experiment with alcohol, about five of us wouldn't want the the experiment to end. Because the estimate is that 10% of the population has alcoholism. And the other part of that is about 95% are still dying of it and don't know tiny, tiny, tiny percentage ever get to Alcoholics Anonymous and ever get well. So um, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in this chapter, but alcohol is a sedative drug. When a non-alcoholic drinks alcohol, they get tired. They get nauseous, and they don't like the feeling of loss of control. When you and I drink alcohol, it's like lighting the burner. That's an abnormal reaction. We don't know it's abnormal because it's the only reaction we ever had. And the guys we hang with have the same reaction. So there's nothing abnormal about that. Do you think so? No, nope, no. Nope. Sit around with your buddies. Do you think we're abnormal? No, not at all. Give me another shot. You know? But for some reason, we become addicted to a non-addictive substance. Ethyl alcohol is non-addictive for 90% of the people that use it. That's why they separate it in this context from drug addiction. We'll do questions on the on the uh, on the break. So, to whom it may concern, this is an open letter he wrote for AA. I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In late 1934, I attended a patient. This is Bill, who, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. In the course of his third treatment, 
he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. These he got from his buddy, Ebby. We're going to read about this in his story. Um, as part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. The doctor thinks they've recovered, too. Again, from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Not from the illness of alcoholism, but from the effects of it. I personally know scores of cases who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. This is the doctor saying, (coughs) some of these guys come in here, (coughs) we treat them, we shrink them, we give them hot baths, we give them vitamins and exercise, and we tell them, you know, look at what this is doing. Look at what this is doing. And they go, oh, yeah, thanks. (laughs) They therapize them a little bit. They get them healthy physically. And they go away, and they're fine. But there's always been this group that Silkworth was working with that was unscathed by this kind of attention. It just didn't work. The kind they'd regard as hopeless. And he'd seen tens of thousands of guys like this. So I personally know of, of scores of cases who were of the type with these other methods failed completely. These facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid growth inherent in this group. They may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. These men may have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. He's describing a guy that was hopeless. Now he's describing a guy of integrity. You can rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. Very truly yours, William D. Silkworth, Silkworth, M.D. When this first, when this book first came out, Silkworth signed it Dr. XXX because this was heresy in the medical community and the, and the psychiatric community. This was way out of the box. And his whole career was on the line. And we'll, we'll see it in, in the rest of this chapter, but also in his relationship with Bill, the guy was, the guy was, uh, Just the right guy to have in that position at that time. Just the right guy. So, now A is talking. The physician who at our request gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. It didn't satisfy us to be told that we could control our drinking, just couldn't control our drinking, just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality, or were outright mental defectives. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us, but we're sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, in Alcoholics Anonymous belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. I will tell you today, in 2007, there's a whole lot of the medical and the mental health community that doesn't buy this, that doesn't support it, doesn't believe it. They want to medicate it and they want to therapize it. And that that's their deal. And it, and it works in some cases and it doesn't work in other cases. <laughs> um, but there's an interesting uh, idea embedded in this paragraph we just read that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as the mind. Then we go to this argument. It didn't satisfy me just to be told that I couldn't control my drinking just because I was maladjusted to life. Because we all know reasons we drank that were negative. I'm pissed off. I lost my job. I didn't get a raise. She left me. She came back. We had a baby. Someone died. You know, and I drank. Okay? But what about when everything was going great? What about when everything was... I'm finally back... I'm getting it together. I'm back on track. Things are working. I'm getting caught up. Da, da, da. And all of a sudden, we get invited somewhere, or the thought crosses our mind, you know, I think I'll just have a beer and watch the game. <clears throat> and it's a week later. And you wake up in jail, or you wake up in your car, or you wake up somewhere, and you go, oh, man, what happened? This idea that I have a physical sensitivity to alcohol is critical in this. Because it's an abnormal reaction. So they're asking me, do I have that reaction? And you don't have to be clear on this question at this moment, but it's a question. Because if I don't have an abnormal reaction to alcohol, I'm not an alcoholic. If you're not an alcoholic, you're wasting your time and your money being here. 
if you are an alcoholic, or you think you might be, then this is something to pay attention to. We got this problem. We can't drink successfully. That means we can't drink and not have negative consequences, okay? So here's the deal. I got a pint of whiskey on the table. That is not a problem till I put it in my body. Because you can't have the phenomenon of craving until the alcohol's in your system. So everything before you pick up the drink is the mental obsession. So is my problem in the bottle or is it in my head? It's in my head. That's why I can't stay sober. We'll talk more about that. Um, the doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As laymen, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Though we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. More often than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached, as he has then a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. <coughs> Just a little caveat for the guy that's reading this thing. You might want to think about going to the hospital, you know. Um, but when every 12-step Bill, Bill was drinking in the kitchen. So you can get the seeds of this idea planted in almost any condition. So, we're back to the doctor. The doctor writes, The subject presented in this book seems to be of paramount importance to those afflicted with alcoholic addiction. I say this after many years' experience as medical director of one of the oldest hospitals in the country treating alcoholic and drug addiction. There was, therefore, a sense of real satisfaction when I was asked to contribute a few words on a subject which is covered in such masterly detail in these pages. We doctors have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology, thats just, morals are just your values, value psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics, but its application presented difficulties beyond our conception. In other words, we knew what was wrong, but we didn't know how to flip the switch for these guys. What with our ultra-modern standards, our scientific approach to everything, we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. Powers of good is a synonym for him for God because Silkworth was not a religious man. But he had recognized that there was something moving in these guys that were getting well. Uh, many years ago, one of the leading contributors to this book came under our care in this hospital. And while here, he acquired some ideas which he put into practical application at once. The idea he got from Silkworth was this, you have a physical allergy idea. You're physically different and you've got some mental problems too. We got the second step from Carl Jung. But the uh, that's where this thing came in the door for Bill, is the doctor equated him with a new way of looking at his problem. Bill, I think you might be one of these allergic types. Really, that's interesting. That's interesting. You know, if you have an allergy to strawberries, you don't every three or four months grab a box of strawberries and start eating them to see if you still have the allergy. You just stay away from that because you don't want to break out in hives, don't want to get throat clubs, don't want to in the emergency room. But we got this allergy to ethyl alcohol, and we can't leave it alone. But it doesn't look like an allergy to us. You know, it doesn't have the typical allergic... I don't break out in a rash. I break out in spots. Kansas City, Chicago, Minneapolis, jail, hospitals. I break out, but it doesn't look like an allergy. <coughs> Break out in handcuffs, car accidents, divorces, yeah. So, later he requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here, and with some misgiving, we consented. No kidding. Bill's been in there three times. And in those days, when you started showing up at the hospital, you were usually beyond help. Now he's grabbed this thing between Silkworth and Ebby. He's got something that's working. He's had an experience. And now he's going, oh, Silky, let me talk to the patients. Can you imagine? Uh, okay, we'll try it. Yeah. The cases we've followed through have been most interesting. In fact, many of them are amazing. The unselfishness of these men, as we've come to know them, the entire absence of profit motive, and their com community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has labored long and wearily in this alcoholic field. 
They believe in themselves and still more in the power which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. Of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor. This often requires a definite hospital procedure before psychological measures can be of maximum benefit. And we are going to take some psychological measures in the steps. We are going to take a therapy for our thinking. It's just not going to be the doctors. It's going to be Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, to back up that little caveat I did about alcohol, alcoholism and drug addiction being two different things, if you're a drug addict and you don't drink and you're in this room, these steps will work exactly the same. There's over 220 different 12-step groups in the United States using these steps for what they think is their problem. I overeat. I'm emotionally unstable. I can't control my rage. I spend too much. Debtors Anonymous. I live with alcoholism, Al-Anon. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So uh, the reason that works is because the malady in all those situations is the same. It's spiritual. It's not the... It's not the vehicle that we rode in here. It's not, did you come in here on a pipe or did you come here on a bottle? The solution's exactly the same. I need to find a power, establish a relationship with the power, and change the way I think and the way I see the world. And I can't do that without help. I can't do that without assistance. So... We believe in so suggested... Did I read that? Okay. We believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol in these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. So there's another question. First question was, do you have an abnormal reaction to alcohol? Now they're saying this phenomenon of craving, which none of us really even knew we had while we were drinking, is limited only to alcoholics. So now the question is, do I have this thing called a phenomenon of craving? the hell is that that is i take a drink and then i can't stop drinking the reason it's tricky is because it doesn't present like that like i'll give you uh, my example i I had obviously problems drinking and um, it was obvious to me and i even stopped drinking a few times once i stopped for almost 11 months but i had to do a lot more other drugs while i wasn't drinking You know, I stopped drinking, but I never stopped medicating myself. Um, I think I just forgot what I was going to say. Phenomenal craving. Oh, here it is. So I would go in. I would stop at the bar to have a beer and a a burger, and I'd stop and have a beer and a burger and I'd leave. Sometimes I'd just have a burger and a Coke and leave. And I'd come in and have a beer and a burger and leave. Sometimes I'd come in and I'd have a beer I have a burger, and then I have another beer, and then someone would come in, and they'd say, hey, why don't you get some pool? Oh, yeah, I'll get some pool. And by the end of the day, it was 1.30 in the morning, and I was shit-faced, and I'd been in the bar all day. The phenomenon of craving kicked in, and it started making the, the, the choices about the next drink. Now, if you would have said, oh, look it, you have the phenomenon of craving, I would have said, no, I just changed my mind. I'm just going with the flow. You understand? He came in, bought a round. I had to buy a round. Then he came in, and we bought him a round. Then he bought us a round, and, and that's the way it worked. You know? There's no phenomenon of craving. It, I didn't recognize the phenomenon of craving until I got sober and started studying this stuff. Because I went nuts in my early sobriety thinking I was craving a drink. And some of you guys are jonesing for a drink right now. And it isn't the phenomenon of craving. You can't crave ethyl alcohol if it's not in your system. What you're experiencing is what they call the mental obsession. I have a mind that will not leave the idea alone. So what happens? You think about it long enough, you have to do it. You have to do it. There's the powerless part. So, do I have the phenomenon of craving? <clears throat> These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. So get rid of the O'Doul's idea. In any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they can't break it, having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up in them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Anyone had that experience? 
I mean, I got to the point where I couldn't answer the phone. It had ring and I go, mm, mm, mm. I couldn't pick it up because I didn't know who was on the other end. Same with the door. I get a knock on the door. I got to run out the back, down the alley, around the corner, and check out the cars on the street. Because I don't know who's on the other side of the door. If it's those guys I owe money to, I'm going to get shot. And I don't want to talk to bill collectors. I had another little problem. I quit paying taxes. I saw no reason to pay taxes. It cut into my drinking money. And so I hadn't paid taxes in five years, federal or state. Um, Problems become astonishingly difficult to solve. They're not talking about the big problems, you know, like, God, you know, problems. You would think, most people would think having warrants out for your arrest in a a few states is a problem. It's not a problem if you don't get caught in the state. It's not a problem until you're in the squad car. Then it's a problem. You understand what I'm saying? But this other stuff, like, what am I going to do? How am I going to get up today? Where am I going to go? How I, I can't answer the damn phone. Oh, the electricity's turned off, you know. Astonishingly difficult. My life just overwhelmed me. It was just like standing under a big wave and not coming up. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. <coughs> Can't you see what this is doing to you? Did you? Anyone have those conversations with people that loved you and cared about you? Can't you see what this is doing to you? Can't you see what this is doing to your job, your career, your family, your friends, your parents? Can't you see? What are you thinking inside when they're saying that? I'm thinking, get the hell out of my way. Can't you see what this is doing for me? Because alcohol was what was keeping me alive. I couldn't do life without alcohol. If you took that away, I was sure I would explode. And you would get some on you for sure. You know? So they're coming at it from a totally different perspective. Because in here, this is the only thing I got left that's working. And you're saying, can't you see what a problem this is? And I'm going, no, I can't, frankly. You're kind of a problem. But I don't see this as a problem. This is my solution. And it's the only damn solution I've got. The message that can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. Now, that means I need to meet with someone who's had this experience. By the time we get done with this three weeks, you're going to know a lot about me, and you're going to realize, maybe not for you, but you're going to realize for me that a profound change has occurred in me. And it's still occurring. You can't argue with my experience. You can say no and walk away. I got no problem with that. But you can't say this doesn't work. Because I know it does. And I've helped a lot of people get well doing this. And I know it works. I know it works. The question is not, does this crap work? The question is, are you going to work it? And the answer for most of us, the first few times around is, "Eh, I'll pass I don't think so. This is radical stuff. This is not like, oh, come on in and and you can write your little inventory and you can do you can leave here in 30 days with a fifth step under your belt and pretty soon you'll be done with this shit. You'll get a diploma and you can go have your life back. This is a whole new template for living. It's a radical. It's a nasty. It's a bitch of an idea, but it's a great life. So they're saying, I got to find someone. That when I listen to them and I look into their eyes and I hear what they're saying, I believe they've had this experience. When you sit with that, you will know inside that it's not that I can't do this. It's that I won't do this. And that's really good information to have. It's not that I can't do this. I won't, a sixth grader could do this. It's that I won't. And it's good information to know that I won't. Because then you don't sit around wasting time saying, this shit doesn't work and I hate these meetings. You don't like the meetings? Don't go. Don't go. Don't put a gun to your head and say, go to the damn meeting. And don't go to the meeting and not do the program because you're not going to get anything. That's like sitting in the garage waiting to become like your Chevrolet. You know, it ain't going to happen. So... Nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves. Now, that sounds like there's an out. Maybe you're not one of the nearly all cases. Maybe you're the exception. 
Well, if you think you're the exception, you will try and find out. The reason that clause is in there is because of Jimmy Burwell, who was the, uh, the nasty little atheist that was running around AA in New York in the 30s. And he was the guy that was saying, you don't have to believe in God. You just have to not drink and go to these goddamn meetings. And I'll tell you how wonderful and loving and spiritual our founders were. They would move the meeting and not tell Jimmy where they moved it. Because they were afraid he was going to freak out the new people. And he was saying something completely different than them. They were saying, you got to find God. you got to hook your wagon to God. and you gotta, you got to do this stuff. And Jimmy was saying, I don't think so. Well, eventually, Jimmy did get sober and stayed sober. He was a traveling salesman. And, uh, but he was a bitch from, to the end. I got, I've got recordings of him in the late 60s, and he was out in California, and he was still complaining. You know, fine. But then you go, okay, well, look at Jimmy didn't drink for 25 years. That's nice. Do you want what Jimmy's got? Do you want to around, walk around pissed off the rest of your life? Angry? Restless? Irritable? That's why I drink. If that's all you're offering me is I can be sober and be an asshole, I'll be a drunk asshole. Thank you very much. So, if any feel a psychiatrist directing a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental. Let them stand with us a while on the firing line. See the tragedies, the despairing wives, the little children. Let the solving of these problems become a part of their daily work and even of their sleeping moments. And the most cynical will not wonder that we have accepted and encouraged this movement. We feel after many years of experience that we have found nothing. This is the doctor on the cutting edge of alcoholic and drug addiction. We have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men, and these men were the hopeless ones, than the altruistic moving, movement now growing up among them. This is a cool guy. This is a guy with compassion and empathy. This is a guy who doesn't punch the clock. He's saying... You sit with this. You live with this. You have nightmares about this. You watch these families, and you won't have a question why we've done this radical thing of letting these drunks come in here and work with these other drunks because we found nothing that's more effective. That's a humble man. That's a humble man. That's a good man. That is the perfect man to be placed in this position at this time because anyone else would have screwed it up. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. There you go. Back to the abnormal reaction. What's the effect? The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it, it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They're restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity. After they've succumbed to the desire again, <coughs> as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. No. There's a question. I drink for effect. That's the abnormal reaction. My mother doesn't drink for effect. She drinks to be social. She drinks to welcome you into her house. You know, she drinks like twice a freaking year. She's got a bottle of vodka that she's had for like 10 years. He says, like, shit, you know, what's 30 year vodka like? You know, it's like, come on. <laughs> She doesn't drink for effect. I drink for effect. So the question is, what is the effect when you drink? No, I don't get drunk. I get transformed. When I drank, I would walk into the room, party. And I was so inferior that I would come in, my head would be, i just stare at the ground. And i have a couple of drinks and my head would come up. And i have a couple more drinks and I could start talking. I have a couple more drinks, and I can start talking to the babes, which is why I was there. I have a couple more drinks, and I'm thinking, oh, that's about right. And I have a couple more drinks, and I'm thinking, God, there's a lot of love in the room. When I started into that room, every man and woman in that room was superior to me in every way. More attractive, more desirous, more intelligent, more articulate, more money, more successful, more everything. 
And I got eight or ten drinks in me, by the way, in about 20 minutes. Because you got to get there in a damn hurry. And then I'm having a transformative experience. You all familiar with the, ba- the, the, uh, the piece in the book back in the amends where it's talking about the promises? Promises, promises. You know, a new freedom, new sense. Oh, yeah, I intuitively know what to do. That's what happened with me when I drank. I got the promises. Think about it. That's what happens. God damn it, every problem I had melted away. It's the first time I ever felt comfortable with me. Then I, you know, I'd get several more drinks into this experiment, and I'd find out I could talk. God, I could talk. I could talk about anything. Now, I thought this was a gift. Later on, it was reported to me that was lying. But I could, I could talk to you about anything. Thermodynamics, drag coefficient of a Spanish sparrow at 10,000 feet with a six-ounce twig and a three-knot headwind? Let me tell you about that. You know, and I'm just going on and on, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm winning. This is great. And they're thinking, Jesus Christ, what's the matter with this guy? We're having a different experience. What is the effect? Fears fall from us. That's one of the promises of the steps. That's what happened when I drank. Intuitively know how to get through things that used to baffle me. That's what drinking did. It's one of the promises. God, sense of ease and comfort. Damn it. It's not that I didn't have faith. I just put it in the wrong thing. I put it in the first damn thing that worked, and it was alcohol. It wasn't God. God, frankly, was the last thing that worked. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> but here's your, re- here's your remedy for your relapse. After they've succumbed to the desire again, now, not to the drink, to the want. I got a head that says, you know, the only thing that's going to fix this is a shot of whiskey. Succumb to the desire. The desire, I want to be comfortable. I want to be comfortable. You're an alcoholic. You only got a couple options. I need to get laid. I need to win a bunch of money. I need to drink. I need a fix. After you succumb to the desire again, ah, then the phenomenon develops. Because you see, the ethyl alcohol sitting on the table in the bottle is not a problem until it's in my body. Everything that precedes the drink is the mental obsession. What you need to understand is you're nuts. You're freaking nuts. And my only solution to my problems is I will kill me in slow motion. That's the best I can do. So I can kill me. And I might take a few of you with me, but I'm gonna, that's my solution. So the phenomenon develops. <clears throat> then I pass through the well-known stages of the spree. I drink till I can't drink anymore. I drink till it stops. I drink till it's over. That spree might be a week. It might be a day. It might be two days. It might be ten years. You might not make it out the other end. It's a promise here. Everybody in this room can drink again. But there is no promise that everyone can get sober again. And one of the nastiest things I see going on in AA, all the people coming into our meetings, they all think they can get sober again. I don't know where they're getting that idea. But they come in and go, oh, I'm coming up in 90 days. I always drink at 90 days. <laughs> you know, I've never seen one of these yahoos come back after six or eight, ten months of drinking and just go, I just wanted to come back and tell you guys, miss you, but I don't need you because I started drinking again and my life has gotten so much better Oh, God, I'm telling you, I've got caught up in my debts. I'm square with the IRS. She's back. The restraining orders are gone. I'm not peeing blood anymore. Just wanted to say thanks for the help, and I'll be moving on. They never do that. They come back with their tail between their legs and their head down. And they're ashamed, and they're embarrassed, and they're humiliated. Because alcoholism is a bitch. The line in the book is rapacious creditor. It is just a nasty bitch, and it will take everything you have. So we don't know that we can come back again. There is no promise about that. We all know we can get loaded again. But it's the height of arrogance to think that you can get sober again. So the, the problem seems to be shaping up to be mental. So, and this goes on and on until we either... Sober up or we die. So now they're describing this spiritual experience this way. 
unless this person can experience an entire psychic change. An entire psychic change is a new mind. It's not just, we need to address your drinking. No, we need to address your mind. You need a new unit. It's screwed. You need new everything. That's an ugly thought. Because everyone in this room is thinking, well, I got parts that are fine. I got some things that are working. I don't need a new mind. I need some new thinking over here, maybe. I need a different way of relating to this. I got a few problems. We're going to see later in the book, this doesn't say we have problems. It says we have a problem, singular. And that problem is any thought or idea that separates me from the power. Whether you call it God or the steps or AA or your higher power, or Big Wally, Jewel in the Sky, Mr. Universe, it doesn't matter what you call it. But until you establish a relationship with something that's mysterious and beyond your knowing, you're screwed. On the other hand, strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once this psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he ever despaired despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself (coughs) easily able to control his desire for alcohol. The only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules, which we're going to find out of the steps. Um, (laughs) So men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I can't go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I can't. You must help me. Now, this is a guy who's desperate. I don't think there's probably too many of us in this room that have had that conversation with anyone. I'm desperate to stop. Will you help me? Desperation is a great tool. If you're working with someone who's recovered, (coughs) desperation can be a motivator. It can be a propellant. So can your fear, and so can your anxiety, and so can your insomnia. All of that stuff is going to go away. So, faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, is often not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. That was the same conclusion that Carl Jung came with in Europe. He'd been working on the same problem from a little different angle. They, they saw the problem. You need a new mind, and you need to find a power that can create that transformation for you. Because the idea here that I'm powerless, I can define the problem but I can't solve it with the thing that created it. Though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we've made little impression on the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. It's not saying that there is not a place for medicine and mental health, psychiatry, psychology. It's not saying that those tools can't be useful. It's saying that those tools in and of themselves were ineffective, ineffective with the alcoholic, the hopeless variety that they were working with. I do not hold with those who believe that alcohol has been entirely a problem of mental control. I've had many men who had, for example, worked for a period of months On some problem or business deal, which was to be settled on a certain date favorably to them, they took a drink a day or so prior to the date, and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests. So the important appointment was not met. These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. That's the piece we talked about. What about when everything was coming up aces and everything was fine? And you drank and then you screwed it all up. What was that about? That wasn't drinking to escape. No. That was drinking to overcome the craving that you had no control over. And you also, by the way, didn't know you had. So it starts explaining some of these weird occurrences. There are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving, which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. We kill ourselves. We take a nap with the car on in the garage. We hang ourselves. We blow our brains out. We pick a tree out, go down the highway about 100 miles an hour and slam into something. We kill ourselves because we are without hope. The classification of alcoholics seems most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. There are, of course, the psychopaths who are emotionally unstable. Check. We're all familiar with this type. 
They're always going on the wagon for keeps. They're over-remorseful and make resolutions but never a decision. How many of you said, I'm done drinking? I'm done drinking this week. I'm done drinking this month. I'm done, period. I can't tell you how many times I I was a spree. I was a binge guy, and I'd go on a run for five, six, seven days, and then I'd crash. And I wake up with one of those hangovers where your hair hurt. It hurt to blink. It just, every cell in your body was going, oh, God. And I go, man, I'm done. I'm not drinking this week. I'm not drinking this week. And by Wednesday, I was feeling good enough that I was thinking, you know, you overreacted. <laughs> you've had a few showers. You've had some meals in you. I was a young man. I was healthy. And you bounce back, and you start thinking, Jesus, you know, it's Wednesday. I think I think a week is a little extreme. <laughs> you know, that was Sunday. Uh, it's Wednesday. I'm, I'm feeling okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good to go. Resolution is based in will. I resolve with my will to not drink again. <laughs> I have no power. This is saying never a decision. Ah, I don't want to drink again, so I've made a decision, maybe, to get some help. Ah, if I made a decision to get some help, then what am I doing? What actions am I taking? A decision that is not married to an action is a fantasy. That's why the resolutions never worked, because they were fantasies. I was always going to do it later. I was always going to do it tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. There's a type of man who's unwilling to admit he can't take a drink, (coughs) plans various ways of drinking, changes his brand or his environment. There's a type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol, for a period of time he can drink without danger. And that period of time could be a day, a year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. That period of time is whatever it is for you. The idea presents, and I don't have a defense against it because I'm not spiritually fit. There's a manic depressive type who is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written. There are the types entirely normal in every respect, except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They're often able, intelligent, friendly people. That's Bill's description of us. But that's not the uh, people that live with us. That's not their description of us. They don't sit around going, he's so bright. He's so capable. He's such a good dad. You know, that's not what they're saying. All these and many others have one symptom in common. Here you go. They can't start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. (coughs) This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been, by any treatment with which we are familiar, the medical community, permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence, death sentence. Now I've just spent a million hours with my shrink. I've just been to my 29th treatment with Silkworth. And the end result is always the same conversation. Roger, what we'd like to suggest to you is don't drink. Well, if I could not drink, I wouldn't be here. If you could not drink, you wouldn't be in this room. You'd not drink. I can't not drink. They go, yeah, we know. That's the problem. But we don't know how to fix it. (coughs) AA has a fix for that. I don't fight a drink. Some of the men in this room are fighting a drink right now. You know, if you, when I got sober, my dad sobered up 10 years in front of me, so I knew what recovery looked like. And I really didn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> but uh, when I got sober and I wasn't drinking, I was still working in bars. I was a musician. I was working in bars almost every night. And uh, I was fighting a drink. And I was thinking, God, you know, these AA guys, they don't drink the rest of their damn lives. I don't know if I can get through the night. A week? A month? That seemed like a daunting task. To think that I was never going to drink again. (laughs) I'm sorry. That was just too much. But AA is a great solution for that. Just don't drink today. Just don't drink today. What a concept. I did that, and I didn't even know I was doing it. I'm just not drinking today. I did a lot of crappy things, boy. But I didn't drink. But somewhere in the first, I don't know, in the, in the first year somewhere, the obsession to drink left me. But I was so insane, I didn't even notice. Because I was homicidal, suicidal. I was a, still a pathological, chronic liar. I had, you know, 
And then I hadn't filed taxes in six years. You know, big deal. Still had warrants in a half dozen states. You know, recovery. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, wasn't working for me, but I wasn't doing it. But I was thought I was doing it because I was going to the meetings. I read the book. I didn't see any reason to do the steps. They didn't apply. They didn't apply to me. So do I have this symptom, the phenomenon of craving? Which is it, another way you can ask yourself this is you can say, hey, you know, when I start drinking, can I always stop when I want? And when I was drinking, I was at a course. When I'm done is when I want to stop. And when I'm done will be dictated by the alcohol, not by me. And I, I couldn't see that. I got a disease that will not let me see what it's doing to me. Hmm. So do I have that symptom? Can't start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. It just means I start drinking, and the drink takes a drink, and the drink takes another drink, and pretty soon I'm off to the races, and it's not my plan. You know, very subtly over a period of time for me, alcohol made every decision in my life. Come to the party. Is there going to be booze? Of course there's going to be booze if I was going to be there. But I had to know how much I had to bring, how much I had to stash in my car. I had to know some things, you know. Alcohol was never more than an arm's length away from me. I had it in my pockets. I had it in my guitar cases. I had it under the seat. I had it in the glove box. I had it everywhere. I had stores set up around town that I could get into after hours. If I ran out, I mean, I was, I was connected. <laughs> I, I could die 24/7. Yeah. So the only <laughs> the, in just a second. <laughs> so the only relief they have to suggest is entire absence. That would be great if I could abstain, but I can't. Because when I abstain, my life gets worse. It doesn't get better. When I'm sober, everything gets worse. This immediately precipitates us into a seething cauldron of debate. Much has been written pro and con, but among physicians, the general opinion seems to be that most chronic alcoholics are doomed. They're going to die. Going to die. What's the solution? Perhaps I can best answer this by relating one of these one of my experiences about one year prior to this experience a man was brought in to be treated for chronic alcoholism he had but partially recovered from a gastric hemorrhage it seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration wet brain he had lost everything worthwhile in life and was only living one might say to drink he frankly admitted and believed that for him there was no hope this is a guy who considered himself hopeless following the elimination of alcohol they detoxed him. There was found to be no permanent brain injury. He accepted to believe as if a fact. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. One year later, he called to see me, and I experienced a very strange sensation. I knew the man by name, partly recognized his features, but there all resemblance ended from a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. I talked with him for some time, but was not able to bring myself to feel I'd known him before. To me, he was a stranger, so he left me. A long time has passed with no return to alcohol. He's talking about a transformation so complete that he couldn't recognize the person. Not just physically, but the personality. When I need a mental uplift, I often think of another case brought in by a physician prominent in New York. The patient had made his own diagnosis and decided his situation hopeless, had hidden in a barn, deserted, a deserted barn determined to die. So this guy wasn't looking for help. He was drinking for the end. He went and hid with a bunch of booze and thought, eh, this will be enough. I'll finish the job. <coughs> he was rescued, sounds like an intervention, by a searching party and in desperate condition brought to me. So this guy wasn't asking for help. This guy was planned to die. This was me. Following his physical rehabilitation, he had talked with me in which he frankly stated he thought treatment a waste of effort unless I could assure him, which no one ever had, that in the future he would have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink because he was suffering from the idea that it was lack of will. That was why he couldn't drink, why he couldn't control his drinking. He had it half right, it's lack of power. I don't have the power. I might have the want, I might have the need, but I don't have the power. His alcoholic problem was so complex and his depression so great that we felt his only hope would be through what we then called moral psychology. This is what Bill and those guys were doing, and we doubted if even that would have any effect. So the doctors thought he was hopeless. He thought he was hopeless. However, 
he did become sold on the ideas contained in this book. He has not had a drink for a great many years. I see him now and then. It's a fine specimen of manhood as one could wish to meet. I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through, and though perhaps he came to scoff, he may remain to pray. This is what Alcoholics Anonymous thinks the problem is, a physical allergy. Phenomenon of craving only presents in the alcoholic. And then we have this mental problem that always leads us back to drinking again after a period of abstinence. <coughs> the physical problem is not a problem if I don't have alcohol in my body. But the thinking is the deal. And the thing that's going to screw you up and screw me up is our thinking. And if you sit in this room with a closed mind, you will walk out of here with a bunch of wasted time. Let's take our uh, smoke break. It's five after. Let's come back at a quarter after nine. <laughs> 